Okay, hello. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know me, I'm Greg Engel. I'm the diplomat in residence uh, here at the LBJ School. And I have the very great honor and privilege today of introducing a professional colleague, a good friend, and a fellow singer-songwriter. I had to say that because we're in Austin. We take every opportunity. Uh, Stuart Bowen, who is the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. And Stuart and I met and became good friends uh, last year in Baghdad, where I was serving as management counselor, and Stuart was coming in and out every few months uh, to perform his duties as the Special Inspector General. I think that virtually everybody uh, who follows our engagement in Iraq uh, and, and who's involved in that, whether they supported going into Iraq in the first place or not, understands that the path to a stable Iraq is the successful reconstruction and development of the country's economic, political, social, and physical infrastructure. General George Casey, who some of you might have seen on TV this week with Ambassador Khalilzad, uh, General George Casey, the commander of the multinational force Iraq, is probably the first person to acknowledge that, that victory or success there will not be achieved by military means. The insurgents will be rejected and ejected by the population of Iraq when Iraqis see clear indications that there's hope for the future. And that hope will depend in large part on receiving the services, safety, and security that governments are generally expected to provide their people. Our reconstruction efforts in Iraq are key to that process. Stuart Bowen's job is to ensure that $22 billion that the United States has provided for reconstruction in Iraq uh, is effectively and appropriately spent for the purposes for which uh, that money was appropriated. And so I think it's clear just how important a role he and his office play in connection with our engagement in Iraq. Stewart has been the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction since October 2004, and prior to that, he was the Inspector General for the Coalition Provisional Authority. He's also served in a number of White House positions, which include Deputy Assistant to the President, Deputy Staff Secretary, Special Assistant to the President, and Associate Counsel. He was counsel to the Bush-Cheney transition team, as well as a partner in the law firm Patton Boggs, in Washington, Patton Beggs in Washington. Stewart is no stranger to Texas or to Austin. In addition to serving as Deputy General Counsel to then Governor Bush, he also served as Assistant Attorney General of Texas from 1992 to 94 and Briefing Attorney to the Texas Supreme Court Justice Raul Gonzalez from 1991 to 92. Prior to his legal career and education, he was a U.S. Air Force Intelligence Officer and served for four years in active duty, rising to the rank of captain. So without further ado, I introduce to you my friend, Stuart Bowen. Thanks, Greg. Thank you all. Thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, Greg did an, a truly outstanding job in, in Baghdad as the ambassador for management there. And, um, and you know, I, I really saw from his arrival to his departure the support to everyone, including everyone on my staff, and I have 60 people there, uh, Im uh, improve continuously. So, so thanks for your, your great service to our country and for your friendship, too. We also played a lot of guitar over there, too, and, it is, and he's, a, he's a darn good singer-songwriter, so, so uh, give him a chance there. Thanks to Dean Steinberg, as well, for inviting me, and uh, also uh, I'm happy to have uh, my children here joining me, Marshall Gentry, Sophie Mallory, raise your hand. And thanks to all of you for coming out uh, for, to hear me speak and have some free pizza. And seeing the pizza uh, just reminded me for a moment of the fact that in the Green Zone, there's a pizza hut, believe it or not. You know, imagine what's in Baghdad. That's what's, there's, there's a pizza hut there, and, uh, and it's your alternative to KBR food, which, thanks to Greg, isn't bad now. I mean, it, we have every other Sunday we have uh, lobster tails and steak, which almost seems like a luxury, and, uh, and, but the food is consistently good. Although now we're doing an audit of it and finding that they're spending too much, so I may be uh, public enemy, enemy number one in the eyes of everyone who's going to the dining facility now. Uh, 
there are no Migas in Baghdad, uh, which I had this morning at uh, the Magnolia Cafe, and it's one of the things I, I love whenever I come back to Austin to go to my haunts. M most favorite haunt, of course, is DKR over here uh, to see the, the horns play, but they're, they're going to beat Texas Tech tomorrow evening up there, so I'm going to see it this trip. Uh, I am the Special Inspector General for Iraqi Reconstruction, as you know. Uh, I have been uh, engaged in the oversight of the relief and reconstruction effort in Iraq uh, for uh, two and three quarters years now. And, and that means I've made 13 trips there and spent about a total of 15 months. Uh, I leave a week from today on my 14th trip uh, for another three-week stay. And, and, and I go there a lot because to get the job done, you have to be there, I, I've learned. And, and you have to be on the ground. And, and, and a SIGR is the entity on the ground over there looking after your tax money and how it's being invested. I mean, ultimately, uh, my mission is fairly simple. The taxpayer's watchdog for your investment in Iraq reconstruction. And it's a lot of money. $22 billion in the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, but a lot more. There's the Iraq Security uh, Forces Fund, uh, another $8 billion. And, and the Development Fund for Iraq was another $10 billion at least. So we, we've been pursuing that very challenging job uh, for the last two and a half years. And, and I see it really uh, as playing a force, forcing function. Our mission is to, to force change by providing oversight on the ground. There are 60 people working for me there today, uh, auditors, investigators, and inspectors. The auditors do detailed level, deep, deep looks at, at what's going on, what, what's, what's wrong, what's right with programs. Essentially, what I tell them is go out, don't play gotcha, you find out what's wrong, bring it to management, and tell them what they need to do to fix it. If they fix it, when the report comes out, it'll say you fixed it or you're planning to fix it. And, and, and fix it. And, and, the, and the fact is that the, over time, they've begun to respond uh, to that. And the other, the other important part of that auditing is, is working with people like, like Greg, who bring issues to our attention. We have a, an audit uh, coming out directly as a result of, of work that I, discussions I had with Greg uh, about KBR's oversight. And it'll be one of the first of three audits. And KBR is Ke Kellogg, Brown, and Root, uh, a Houston company that's a subsidiary of Halliburton which, by the way, I read yesterday that Halliburton's going to be selling uh, over the next six months uh, in, um, in a stock offering uh, or unlo uh, unloading themselves of that burden. Uh, uh, our next report comes out Monday. So this, is a, this, this talk is really a preview uh, uh, of what we're going to have to say uh, and that you'll be reading about uh, Monday. And you can go to our website, www dot SIGR, S -I -G -I -R, dot mil. All our reports, our previous 10 quarterly reports on there, 75 audit reports, 70 inspection reports, and, and our lessons learned report are all there. And everything you ever would want to know and not as well uh, about Iraq reconstruction is there. This, this next report is broken up as all our reports are into th four sections. First one is observations. What, what do I see? I write that, that section and just what are the key issues confronting the United States right now within the context of the reconstruction um, in Iraq? Uh, the second will we'll summarize a sector-by-sector -sector overview of what got accomplished this last quarter uh, in Iraq in, in, in water, electricity, oil, transportation, communication, security, very detailed reviews. Because that's part of my mission, to say what we, we're getting. It's a, it's, a, it's a big question mark in a lot of places, and, a, and, a, and so what we try to answer that question. Uh, the third is a summary of all of our audits. Section three is a summary of all, our, all, all of our audits, inspections, and an overview of investigations. That's mostly uh, classified information. And finally, just what, what other, section four is what other uh, organizations are doing, uh, and hopefully we'll do more of uh, over the next year. Uh, the, the issues I see is the most significant facing the United States uh, right now in our effort in Iraq uh, are getting it right in the fourth quarter of the year transition. That's, that's the, the, the rubric under which I've analyzed our current status. This year is the year of transition. We're, we're, we're the, over the last quarter, uh, the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund was finally put completely under contract. $22 billion now, we know how it's going to be spent. Uh, but getting it spent right is 
is another story, and it's, and it's a story we will continue to report on. Uh, the biggest challenge, of course, is security. It's the overlay that has inhibited every action uh, in Reconstruction and otherwise in Baghdad and across Iraq. Uh, the, the, uh, the fact is that, that the sectarian militia uh, chaos that has, that has uh, broken out of, over the, since the bombing of the Samara Mosque, February 2nd, uh, uh, has has uh, simply presented a, an enormous obstacle to to making progress on, on the security front, the economic front, and the political front. My job is to look at the economic front, and and the fact is that we continue to have to spend a lot of our money on security. That is protecting uh, construction sites, protecting those who work at construction sites. And, and training up the Iraqi forces uh, to try and bring security to Baghdad and, and across the country. That brings me to my second issue, rule of law. Training up Iraq's security forces uh, means in, inculcating a, a new ethic with respect to rule of law. That's a complex process, and, and my chief suggestion in this report is that the Department of Justice needs to play a larger role. They have played a relatively minor role with respect to funding. Uh, the the uh, Department of State's uh, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement branch has has received about one and a half billion to do this, but but it's it's mostly contracted out and not well coordinated, in my view. And uh, and then the Multinational Security Transition Command, Iraq, which is the Pentagon's arm for police training, and they've been doing it now for a year, is sort of out of its. Uh, normal uh, um, role when it's the army training people to become police. Uh, the Department of Justice is the locus of expertise on police training, prisons, the judiciary. And, and so my recommendation in this report is that they be given greater charge of that mission in Iraq starting now. Budget execution is the third issue and that, that just means that the Iraqi government the, the unity government, now in office for six months, uh, is having a hard time spending its money, its own money. And indeed, it appears that, that perhaps five to eight billion dollars of their capital budget will remain unspent at the end of this year. Their, their fiscal year is the calendar year. And, and that's a bad sign. Because for, for progress to occur in Iraq, we have to see Iraq's government function as it should to execute relief and reconstruction. There, there's three phases, as I've said in our reporting, uh, of, to the, of the reconstruction program. One, the U.S.-led phase. We're in the fourth quarter of that. that. That's almost done. Two, the multilateral phase. That means the international community needs to step up with funding and, and move the plan forward. Three, Iraq. I mean, ultimately, the work has to be done by the Iraqi government, the Iraqi people, funded by Iraqi money. Not being able to execute a capital budget is a, is a difficult sign with respect to reaching phase three soon. And it also inhibits really engaging in phase two. International donors are not going to want to invest in Iraq if Iraq's not able to spend its own money. And, and they particularly are not going to want to invest in Iraq if the security problems and the corruption problems continue. So the security uh, is the overlay. Rule of law and fighting corruption is another issue. Both of those have to be resolved. And third, the budget execution in order to get the, the EU and the Arab states, the Gulf states, to invest through loans in Iraq's relief and reconstruction. It has to happen because the investment we've made is just a start and, and it, it has to keep moving forward uh, or, or, or the, the, the current devolution could get worse. Uh, our audits focused this quarter uh, on taking a look at how the Multinational Security Transition Command in Iraq has trained up the Iraqi army to support itself. Uh, we, we know they've, tr they've trained about 325,000 police and troops, but, but that's just a start. That's just the beginning. That, 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 that contingent, that enormous group of, of trained soldiers and police has to be supported out in the field and, and, uh, and breakdowns in support. Uh, could could exacerbate breakdowns in security. 
our findings are that uh, there's a lot of work to be done on the Ministry of Interior side. The Ministry of Interior uh, essentially is not showing us their budget for logistical support. And, and that's, that is a huge red flag, of course, uh, as to whether or not they're going to take seriously su supporting their own national and local police. And, and while there's, the situation in the Ministry of Defense is better, and I met with the Minister of Defense this last trip, and he's, he's very, very sharp and, and uh, former brigadier uh, out who's, who fought in Fallujah, uh, notwithstanding his good leadership, uh, there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that the Iraqi forces can be sustained in the field logistically. We also looked at uh, the cost of overhead connected to reconstruction, uh, and it, it came from a meeting I had with the director of the project and contracting office, the entity in charge of managing most of the reconstruction back in 2004, and, and I went to, to ask him why more construction wasn't being done, and, and, and it was part of the reprogram because of security. But then I said, well, are we paying all these contractors over here? Uh, while they're not working? He said, yes. And I said, well, how much is that? He said, four to five million a day. And, of course, that set my IG alarm bells off, and, uh, and I put my staff off to look at that, and we've, we, have, we have the answer now. And the answer is, of course, what you would uh, conclude it probably is, and that is we spent a lot of money paying contractors to wait for direction in 2004. Uh, the the, the third audit, significant audit we have, is the provincial reconstruction teams. This is the most important initiative, I think, in Iraq right now that the embassy is pushing that's non-security related. It's governance capacity building at the local level. There are 10 PRTs across Iraq that, whose mission it is to meet with the provincial council leaders, the governors, and, and give them guidance on how they uh, are going to manage and operate uh, the nuts and bolts of governing. You know, sort of what you study here. I mean, it's out in the field uh, in Iraq through the PRT program. No surprise, the biggest problem there to progress is security. It's hard. Obviously, the, the PRT in Anbar has ver isn't in Anbar. It's in Baghdad. And the, and the Anbar uh, governor, uh, governor and provincial council members have to come to Baghdad to meet. But it's not just there. Basra is not really able to function. Uh, Baghdad is doing well, but it's, it's got its own struggles. What I noticed when I met with the Baghdad PRT during this last trip, uh, as I talked to them about who it is they work with, uh, was that every member, every office in Baghdad, on the provincial council, in the Amanat, the mayor's office, and in the governor's office, is Shia. And that's because on January 30th, 2005, the day of the Purple Finger, you remember, the, an electoral process success, uh, the Sunnis sat it out. They boycotted and, and thus uh, shot themselves in the foot uh, uh, politically because they have no <coughs> voice at any governing table in Baghdad today. So you can, you, can, uh, you can draw your own conclusions about that, but I think it certainly points to to, the, to some of the situations that we see today in Baghdad, traceable back to that day, January 30th, 2005. Uh, finally, we, we did, we've done a number of inspections across Iraq this quarter. Uh, my inspectors, there's, there's, it's a, their inspection teams, engineer, an engineer and an auditor uh, go out, and we, we have visited uh, 80 sites uh, all across Iraq, um, north, south, east, and west. The only place we haven't been is Anbar and, because they won't let us go. Um, this trip, though, we didn't go far. We went to for our most difficult inspection. That was the Baghdad Police College. And it, it, was, it was really the most disappointing uh, visit I have had, experience I've had in my oversight effort in Iraq uh, because it's so important that we get that right. That's the largest police college in the world. It is the center for training security. In, in, in Iraq, and, it's, and it's, it's far from a success. We've spent $73 million there, and, and you, you should go read the inspection, but, but the, 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 the simple breakdowns in, in, in plumbing installation led to, uh, to sewage seeping throughout the, the barracks, eight barracks that they built, and, and uh, it's going to take many millions to repair. Uh, and so, but the good news is, is shining the light of oversight onto that means that 
work is being done there now that's being done right. And, and there's, there's hope that that facility will stay open, that Iraqis will continue to be trained there, and that, that it will get on track and meet the mission that it's supposed to meet. A week from today, I'll return to, to Baghdad. And I'll, I'll spend a few weeks there uh, continuing our mission. Uh, this trip, I'm going to travel to the Al Basra offshore terminal, the most important, uh, the site of, the, of a series of the most important oil projects that we've invested in. Oil is the engine that will bring uh, Iraq its eventual success, and because it, it's the, it, it taps into the second largest oil reserves in the world. Uh, Ninety-five percent of the income is drawn from from oil sales and 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 the fact is that we only we invested nine percent of the earth in, into that sector but the most important investment was at al basra that's where most of the exports occur so we're going to go down there and see how things are going out with respect to to al basra uh so that's that's what i'm doing uh, in iraq i miss not having greg over there uh but but sort of one of the uh realities of life in Baghdad is, is the constant turnover, and it's something we studied in our Lessons Learned reports. You can go read those at our website. We looked at personnel, contracting, and we're working on project and program management. That'll be out in December. And then ultimately, uh, I think, and, and, and perhaps most useful uh, from our office's work will be a book we'll publish next June called The Story of Iraq Reconstruction, which will coalesce all that we've learned in our quarterly reports, all that we've learned in our lessons learned, and then more through a, a whole s through the in-depth interviews we're doing with leadership, and uh, and then I hope provide posterity uh, uh, a, a guidebook for how to do contingency reconstruction in a post-conflict situation or conflict situation, as the case may be. Uh, more importantly, how the system can can be adjusted by Congress to be more robust and prepared and agile for uh, engaging in, in what uh, is always going to be an extremely challenging and difficult enterprise. So thank you all for coming out. It's good to be back in Austin, and uh, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Right here. Um, as you acknowledge, uh, our relations with contractors have been somewhat mismanaged, and, and overhead payments have been excessive. My question is, uh, I might add, I'm an accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Good. My question is, um, why has it taken you four years to, A, figure that out, and, and two, to put in appropriate controls? And it seems to me that, uh, that the, it seems to me, and indeed the GAO has confirmed this, that, that the internal administrative, accounting and administrative controls were not properly in place. <laughs> why is that? Well, I mean, if you go back and read our reports, you know, www.sigger.mil, you'll see we've been talking about this for, actually we've been around for uh, about two and a half years. And if you go and, and read our reports, you'll see we've been commenting. You, you may remember the DFI audit we did about controls, you know, the, about this, the famous missing $9 billion. You, you, you may have heard of that. Now, we'll, we'll go, go take a look at that. You'll see that we raised red flags on that early on. Uh, the fact is is in, in, in three years uh, that, that, we've, that, that the United States has been in there, three and a half roughly, uh, the, we've had four governments in Iraq. Uh, there, there's been a fundamental transition from management by DOD to Department of State halfway through. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, I have been pushing for terminations for default on contractors for in six, 16, 17 months now, and this year that's finally starting to happen. Uh, the, the fact is, is that the system uh, was was developed on a somewhat ad hoc basis, and and that's the problem. The system ought to be ready to respond. That's the whole point of lessons learned. You know, the the, the money is mostly obligated. The money is mostly spent. Uh, the point of oversight is to raise concerns by shining the light of insight. Uh, so that foresight improves. Yes? When you talked about the uh, current problem of paying contractors when security, uh, se security causes delays, you said that we know about this problem and we're not going to, we need to stop paying for them to wait. Um, could you get, go into the solution a little bit more? Because I'm a little bit stymied for how you would release contracts. I mean, all the contracts can have start dates, end dates. Right. And, and yeah. 
you, how, would, how will they respond to well, a security situation without being paid? Well, that, that, that's exactly right. And that's why the, there, there's no one size that fits all in contracting. And, the, and, the, and one size was tried pretty much across the board in Iraq in in 2004. You're familiar with cost plus contracting, design build contractors. Uh, I call them open checkbook arrangements. And, and, and the fact is, is that, that when you, the, the, it's, it's, it's based on the premise that there's a risk assumed by the contractor in a war slash post-war environment. And, and second, there's limited knowledge about re contract requirements. And, and given those two factors, cost plus was appropriate certainly for in, for many situations, but the key or the path out of that, the path to accountability is definitization. And definitization was not done on a timely basis. We did an, we performed an audit on that, raised concerns about it, called for it. We're calling for it well before the audit, uh, but our audit from last quarter pointed out that 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 the DOD contracting entities in Iraq concluded that the definitization requirement in that situation in the CPA, post-CPA uh, sort of age of legal ambiguity was voluntary. And so the core cost control was eviscerated from the, the cost plus process. Uh, my testimony to, to uh, the Senate Committee on Government Affairs and Homeland Security was that the cost plus system needs to be reviewed not not done away with, but reviewed in detail in light of the Iraq experience. Sir. Sir, with regards to infrastructure, water, sewer, electric, roads, the utilities, the backbone of the country, you have two and a half years of personal experience now of observing that. What's the trend? Overall infrastructure trend? Uh, well, it's, it's bad this month, that's for sure. Electricity, as our report will show, uh, into Baghdad dropped below four hours. Uh, daily uh, in the second and third week of October. And the reason is uh, continuous attacks on infrastructure, particularly the, the uh, Baghdad ring, the, the power lines bringing power in from the north and the south now. They always hit the northern line, the Beijing to Baghdad line. That's, you know, that's been repaired 30 times, you know, if once. And, and uh, but, but the strategy expanded. Uh, it has expanded over the last few months, and it has had uh, acute effects upon available power into Baghdad. Uh, it, it's they, they've there are measures in place to address it. There 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 was a very complex and thorough infrastructure security training program that the that the multinational security transition command Iraq is is engaging in. It's much better than what was going on earlier, but uh, but. But the attacks upon the infrastructure have, have been, as I've said all year in our reporting, uh, m one of my biggest concerns. The overall uh, coordination of infrastructure, sewage, water, oil, uh, is, is not been effective as it should have been because of this $5.6 billion that had to be moved from bricks and mortar into security. And the, 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 con the Congress anticipated and specified in their conference report to the to the law creating creating the Iraq Relief Reconstruction Fund, a whole laundry list of, of significant projects. And that list was pared down and altered many times since then, something we called in our report the reconstruction gap. But, but the core issue is this, the, the U.S. program never was meant to rebuild Iraq. It was meant to get Iraq started on the road to relief. Uh, it's just that that road, we're, we're, le we're, we're not as far down that road as as uh, as we all wish we were. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we appreciate Thank you. your talking to us. Thank you. Um, I have a question, uh, not particularly about Iraq, but uh, how how does one get to be qualified to be the Inspector General? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I understand you've done a lot of great things. I, I just wonder what particular. Uh, well, I don't think there is a there is not a prerequisite to it. I think that you know I was a civil prosecutor down here. Few blocks away uh, for a few years, and uh, and then uh, was engaged in a whole variety of of uh, insight and oversight activity in the course of my legal career in various spot stops. But but no, nothing nothing obviously uh, 
uh, can prepare one for this this challenge. Uh, and there were some people that raised questions about that. Uh, those questions have largely been withdrawn over the last couple of years. Yes. Yes. You rightly raise three points: security, rule of law, and essentially budgets. Right. To me, without security, the other two are unobtainable. Right. Uh, I listened to any suggestions as to how we solve the security issues. Bringing justice in to train police seems a good idea, mm -hmm. but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. What other indicators are there that we can deal with the security problem? Because without a sense of the, the in a sense, the fact that as you began your wise comments, that the, the government operates. Without that sense, you're not going to have any any solution to the That's right. virtual issues. That's right. Uh, good points. The, the three things that, that are being pushed forward by Ambassador Khalilzad and General Casey right now in Iraq are, first, the National Plan for Reconciliation. Uh, uh, it's a hopeful plan. Uh, the hope is that by bringing those leaders, engaging them directly face-to-face -to -face, uh, together, that, that they will change their hearts and change their minds about the conflict. That's a hopeful enterprise. Uh, the the uh, more pragmatic components of it include a new hydrocarbon law, uh, which will make sense of how oil revenue is distributed across Iraq. Uh, follow the money, as they say. And, and indeed, the way oil lies underground in Iraq uh, doesn't uh, uh, fit the distribution of the various groups. The Shia have most of it. The Kurds have some of it, the Sunnis have none of it. And so managing that revenue distribution is key to try to promote the peace. The third component is amnesty. How, how the, the vengeance is, is, of course, driving a lot of the conflict, a lot of the sectarian militia. Uh, I call it relative anarchy, not civil war, relative anarchy. And, and What's the distinction? The distinction is they haven't drawn clear sides. There's so many elements, and there's no... Shia versus Shia. Well, there's, there's Shia versus Shia in Basra. What's going on in Basra, it's Iraq and Iran Shia fighting. There's, and, and then up in, up in Baghdad, it's, it's Shia, Shia, Sunni, and, uh, and the U.S. mix, you know, all in there. So there's, there, are, there are all sorts of motivating causal factors. Uh, but I, I, I think that... The point I made about the lack of democratic representation for the Sunnis at the governing table in Baghdad is a significant one. The, the provincial elections were supposed to be held in September, and they were postponed because of the delay in the forming of the national government this year until May. They're, they're now scheduled for next March. It seems to me, and this is out of my lane, but without a legal voice, uh, at the table on a daily basis where there is some say about how police uh, infrastructure and uh, investment is managed that that there's no direct motivation for the Shia to change course and and so the, if, if, if provincial elections could be held sooner that would be in my view a, a uh, salutary uh, event you don't over Peter Galbraith's view, splitting the country in three parts. Well, I, I think the view's a little bit of a red herring because the Constitution, as it's written, anticipates that virtually. The Constitution, the vote that occurred last week or week before last now on regions uh, was a little bit miscast in, in the press. The, the Constitution says that any two provinces in Iraq can form a region, and once those once that region is formed, Regional law trumps federal law, so it's a reverse preemption doctrine. Second, taxation authority is lost by the federal government over that region and belongs exclusively to the region. Third, the regions can form their own militias. Scary. Well, I, well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know whether break up or not break up is is good, uh, but or which one is better. But 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 the point is, the Constitution anticipates virtual breakup and so I you know I just under the terms of the Constitution alone I would I would expect 
uh, those regions to form along sectarian lines that people that Peter Galbraith generally alludes to in his book. Yes. Aside from anticipating the next election, what is the Iraqi government doing to encourage more representation from Sunni and Kurdish leadership? At the federal level, a lot. The the the, uh, the, the lack of of <coughs> sufficient democracy, if you will, at the provincial level is not reflective of the situation at the federal level. The federal level is a unity government. There, the president is a Kurd, uh, the speaker is a Sunni, the prime minister is a Shia, uh, the deputy prime minister is, is, a, Shi is a Kurd, uh, and, and so, so there is a lot of diversity, and then there's diversity certainly among ministers uh, that sometimes is disabling. There, there are four quote, solderist ministries that don't function very well, transportation, interior, uh, finance, uh, and housing. And, and that's, that's uh, uh, so, but, but the diversity is there. The, the, um, the, the, the issue is, to me, provincial. It's local government and, 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 and you know, all, uh, you know, local control is, is uh, is sort of the source of, of, uh, of, of, of really gra grassroots democracy. And, but for local control to work, there needs to be a real provincial election. Could you talk a little bit about how your office deals with the sort of cultural divides in, in the reconstruction work? A state conducts reconstruction differently than DSC, mm -hmm. and CPA did things a little differently than both. Right. But more importantly, the cultural divide between the way the Iraqis would like to reconstruct and the way we would in terms of ideas of fiscal responsibility, in terms of the definition of corruption, and, and the way, how, how do we put our ideas on that, which may or may not match, onto Iraqi reconstruction, and, and how does your office deal with those differences? Oh, that's a lot there. Uh, the, the first point you make is a good one. Uh, and that is that there was stovepiping, as the, as the phrase goes, uh, which means uh, insufficient coordination among DOD, state, and AIT, the primary players uh, there. But, but other agencies had, you know, not small amounts of funding to spend as well. The, the, there was the National Security Presidential Directive 36 made the chief of mission in charge of everything going on in Iraq Reconstruction. That, that was signed by the President in May of 2004. That, as I read it, should have been enough, but it wasn't. Uh, because it's hard for, you know, a man in uniform to serve two masters here. I mean, ultimately, it's the Department of the Army that he, he felt that he, that, that, that commander of the Corps of Engineers was, that he was reporting to. And uh, I, I think that a lot of those issues have been resolved thanks to an increasingly forceful uh, style of leadership that Ambassador Khalilzad has demonstrated. Uh, and, and, and I would say, let me just say this as, as a global comment, the story of Iraq Reconstruction is a story of gradual progress, of recognizing what's not working and doing our best to adjust, and I'd like to think we've played you know, a role in promoting that. Um, the Iraqi part, though, that's, that's where we are now. And, and that's what the provincial reconstruction teams are doing, are working with the provincial reconstruction development councils, which are all Iraqi, uh, to select uh, projects to do moving forward. The, the, uh, the budget issue is connected to that. I, I mean, there, there's part of it is capacity, and part of it may be political will. Uh, and, and it's time uh, for Iraq to really start funding and moving forward their relief and reconstruction plan, plan that should be better coordinated and, 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 uh, and structured. And that's what we're trying to advise them on, uh, notwithstanding our experience to date. Um, the $22 billion in the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, this, this, this will be one of my lessons learned. The fact is it was all grants, no loans. Uh, it, it, it was So nothing was asked of any Iraqi uh, in exchange for that. And they were consulted, but but there were no there was no milestoning or benchmarking, and 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 I think you noticed recent public comments from the administration that 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 benchmarking and milestoning will be part of any further aid. Yes. Uh, to, to go to 
jumper into that funding issue, if you could talk for a moment about the transition from a unilateral source to actually reconstruct the fund towards uh, a multilateral source. Right. How are we going to get uh, multilateral, how are we going to get donor nations to put money into the situation as um, there's more and more security problems and the, the possibility of you know, civil war or, or um, deconstruction of the, of the federal system in Iraq? Well, first of all, the, the, the regionalization of Iraq has been put off eight, by 18 months. So that's, that's no longer an issue as a result of the recent vote for now. Uh, but, but as I said, r the relief and reconstruction of Iraq is a three-phased approach. The, the first phase is in its fourth quarter, uh, and that is, that's the U.S.-funded phase. The, the Madrid conference, you, you might remember, which occurred in 2003 and, and resulted in the promise of $13 billion, didn't produce but a fraction of that, about $3 billion. It's a lot of money, mostly from Japan and, and Great Britain. Uh, but, but the Gulf states uh, need to step up. They have an interest in a stable Iraq, and, and, that, and that is part of what the international compact for Iraq is going to do, and that is going to energize the multilateral phase. It's, it's being discussed now. It will be implemented by the end of the year, and it will... Uh, seek to uh, to uh, hold Iraq accountable to accomplish certain milestones in exchange for aid from from donors who would participate in the international compact. The most successful international or two the two most successful international uh, negotiations regarding Iraq to date have been the IMF standby agreement from last December, which 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 is a perfect example of what needs to be done moving forward. The standby agreement said. Okay, we're going to, the, the, the participating nations will forgive this level of debt if you accomplish these things, like cut your gasoline subsidies in half. They did that. You know, it's still heavily subsidized, but, but they did that, and as a result, debt's being forgiven. They're, they're meeting deadlines or, or benchmarks, according to the SBA, and as a result, debt is being forgiven. And the Paris Club debt relief uh, has been effective as well, which is part of that process. But the International Compact... Uh, and needs to take it to the next level for the multilateral phase to succeed. There's yes. Okay. Uh, Good. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about population transfer. Um, I've heard a lot of people comment that it's ultimately going to be necessary for people to move, you know, either. It's going on now. Yeah, but. Internal are, migration. Are you helping them move? Or are they just moving because. You know, there's kind of a, an ethnic cleansing that ought to be happening. You know, there, there, there is an office that's within the embassy uh, on internal migration that 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 uh, works with refugees. Yes, um, it, it's such a large issue, though. Uh, more needs to be done. So, are you saying that you agree that um, ultimately these people won't be able to live? among themselves, and they will have to be ethnically separate. No, no, I'm not saying that. I mean, it, I'm just acknowledging that, 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 that because of the current security situation, uh, a lot of Iraqis have left Iraq, uh, and, and uh, many Iraqis have moved to safer zones. So, uh, I just, do you, so, uh, do you believe that that's going to be necessary, that you know, we're actually going to have to actively help ethnically separate the country. No, no, I hope not, because I hope that we're going to have provincial elections that will inject more democratic local rule and and result in a in a, a lessening of the the violence and thus more peaceful means towards uh, a reconciled governing process. That was the last question. All right, good. I appreciate you all taking time to uh, hear about what we're doing. And uh, Greg, it was great to see you, and thanks for, thanks for coming out. And it's good to be back in Austin. Thank you all.